this morning is just refresh us on a scripture that we all know, but I need to put it in the forefront of our thinking because I think it's time to see it in a way maybe we haven't seen before, and even if we have, it's time to see it again. And that scripture is John 10.10. 10. And most of you, or many of you, probably know it by heart. But I want to refresh this because this is where Jesus tells us the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I come that you might have life and life abundantly. I've heard that spoken this morning in this atmosphere. I've heard so many things that I was thinking and meditating on in the last 24 hours already put in the atmosphere here this morning. So that just assures me God is establishing something that's going to bear fruit. So now when I looked at this scripture again, when I looked up the word abundantly, it means advantages beyond measure. Advantages beyond limits with no limit on them. Now I thought, my goodness, Lord, that's bigger than I can wrap my mind around. But what he's saying is that's obvious in 1010 is the enemy is only going to steal, kill, or destroy. But I came to give you advantages beyond measure. I came to give you advantages without limits. And that totally contradicts. Stealing, killing, and destroy contradicts abundant life. So my point today is, if we're going to live with these unlimited advantages God said was ours, then we're going to have to be aware of when the contradictions come into our life, and that's not happening. And the reason I say we're going to have to be aware is we're going to have to overcome the things that contradict abundant life. We can't just live with them and tolerate them and act like, oh, well, that's life. I don't know about you, but I, that, that attitude just, it, it, <laughs> it grinds on me of, oh, well, that's just life. I hate to hear people say that. I hate to hear, oh, well, that's, that's just part of life, honey. You have to do that. No, no, no. I've never accepted that. I mean, I, it's why for years I thought I was a rebel, y'all. And I was always <laughs> under condemnation of, uh, you know, I wasn't doing drugs and all this stuff, but I thought, no, I'd sit on the church bench. That's where I was and think, I don't think that's what the Lord meant when he's talking there. But, of course, I wouldn't tell people what I was thinking. But uh, th when I was in my 30s, this man, we were in a meeting. I don't even remember where it was. And he walked across the auditorium and walked up to us. We didn't know him. And he said, the Lord told me to come over here and tell you, Kathy, that you're not a rebel. And I thought, that was the best word I ever got in my life. I thought, thank you, Lord. Thank you. And I knew that was God because I'd never said that to anybody. But the truth is, if we're going to look for contradictions in our life, we don't have to go very far to find them. Mm -hmm. Most of the contradictions that are tripping up what's going on as far as abundant life is right on your front porch. And I'll tell you why I say that. Sometimes, well, I'll give you an example. You may have heard this example, but it's vivid in my mind. I, uh, I walked out my door one day, and we live on the second story. So I'm walking out the front door, headed down the stairs to go somewhere. I get down to the third step, and suddenly I stop and realize when I came out that door, I saw something moving in my peripheral. So I whip around and look back up on the roof. We're talking second story porch, roof, ledge, and that the snake crawling across the ledge of the second story. That was hard for me to believe. First of all, I'd never seen a snake like up there, and why is he on my porch? And of course, Marty's gone on this day. And I'm looking up there and I thought, oh my goodness, I run back across the porch, get in the house. Marty's in Huntsville helping our brother-in-law. I call him, I said, where is the shotgun? He said, what in the world is going on? <laughs> and I said, well, there is a snake on the roof of the second story porch. He said, well, you can't use the shotgun. You'll tear the house up. I said, the house can be fixed. <laughs> the gun is for the snake that has to go. And he's sometimes men and women's priorities. <laughs> he said, just go get the 22. It won't scare the neighbors. Go get the 22. So I get the 22 and I open the front door and I've got it aimed up there. And the first one hits it, it hits the floor and it's writhing, pitching a hissy fit, going every which way. And I'm pump, shoot, pump, shoot. <laughs> um, when he got home later, there were empty shelves on the car carpet. He said, uh, Why are these shelves on the carpet? I said, 
Did you think I was going on the porch with a snake? <laughs> Not knowingly. No, no. Again, men's and women's priorities are a little bit different. And so uh, the snake then, he, you know, if you don't get him in the head, he ain't dead. And so uh, shot or not, he's got blood, but he's not dead. He goes under the porch. He gets down over the door downstairs. And so I'm headed down the stairs every step. Pump, shoot, pump, shoot. I get down there, and I'm like within six or seven feet of uh, the, the house, the cement porch down there. And he's, he's there kind of slow now, but he's laying, <laughs> laying every which way. And I keep shooting till the last shot ricochets on my pant leg, and I think, that's probably enough. <laughs> and so uh, when Marty gets home, there were blood and guts and snake parts all over the concrete downstairs. And he said, what in the world happened? I said, I killed snakes. <laughs> he, said, he said, how many times? <laughs> I said, till he was sure he was dead. <laughs> and I've heard they travel in two, so if he had friends or family watching, they knew not to come on the porch. <laughs> and that's literally what I was thinking, y'all. If you got family, I'll kill them too. You just tell, take the message home. But I kept shooting until the contradiction was contradicted. I mean, was that thing a contradiction to my plans for the day? You can bet your boots and your saddle it was. Because I wasn't about to leave and leave that thing to come and go like he thought he could. It just, the audacity of him being on my porch had already just went, pushed me way beyond limits. And I thought, no, I'm not leaving till this thing is dead because it's a contradiction to my lifestyle. Mm -hmm. that I had had a, a, a stay, we had a guest downstairs and she called on her phone and said, Kathy, you gotta come, there's a snake outside the door. And this one was a spread natter and uh, Marty wasn't home. <laughs> I, I'm not even gonna go into that. And uh, <laughs> and I didn't have a gun that day, didn't know where it was, and didn't know where the, the bullets were either. And uh, I had to call the neighbor, and he came down and he said, oh, this, this won't hurt you. I said, I don't care, he's on my property, he's dead. And I said, you can take him home if you like him, but I want him dead. <laughs> but he killed him for me. But I wish all contradictions in our life were as obvious as that snake was that day. But sometimes they're right on our front porch and we don't know they're there. And they're, what I'm talking about, of course, is the front porch of our soul. And where other people can see real plainly what, what's wrong and what's going to trip us up, we just, we're not, it's not that obvious to us. I mean, we're, especially if you've got something on your porch that is there all the time, you won't even notice it. And if it's a usual part of your life, really familiar, you don't think about it like do something that is not normally there. So if we're usually irritated or critical, we probably don't even notice when we're that way. If we, if we, it's nothing, uh, if it's nothing new to you to be easily discouraged or quick to take offense, you're not going to notice that you may do that 10 times in one day because it's normally on the por front porch of your soul. And we don't have to be thinking about some old things that we suffered, or we don't have to be going back through our memories that haven't faded. We don't have to honestly be thinking about it, but they're still there. They're still having an effect on our attitude and our atmosphere. And those, and it, it, these kind of uns, your unspoken fears, you might not say what you're afraid of. You might not have told yourself what's bothering you and your frustrations, but those things can be like a mood fog you walk out of your house, walk right into that fog, take it with you all day. That atmosphere touches every conversation you have, every person you run into. It's something that is there that you are not aware of, but it contradicts who you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to be doing. Now, family traits you grew up with, you really don't notice those until the Holy Spirit points them out. You don't notice how they take you captive or how they trip you up in life. Because if you come from a family that's always been harsh and judgmental, that's nothing new to you. You won't even notice when you're being judgmental or opinionated. I know wherever I speak, I come from a very opinionated family. We can argue until we win the argument, whether we're right or wrong. wrong. And it's very opinionated what we think that's the way it is. And you don't question it. You just call that normal. And everybody that knows you knows that that's normal, but what you don't know is what it is robbing you of because it's a contradiction. Because if your characteristics 
undermine you and contradict what God has in mind for you or who God has in mind for you to be, those things can undermine your reputation, your relationships. They can even undermine what you were supposed to be on the job or what you were supposed to be in a career. They can undermine any kind of fulfillment or success. And if they've been there all your life, see, you can live and die and never know that. But the Holy Spirit will point these things out because he wants you, us free and up to overcome what contradicts and opposes us. But we have to learn to listen. That's why I started with we got to learn to be aware of what's contradicting God's will in our life to make it an abundant life. And if we don't realize that the contradictions are working against us, we tolerate them. We call it things like, oh, that's just their personality quirk or that's just a character flaw that, that all the Buchanans have. You know, that, and people just live and think that way. I can say Buchanan even on a recording because that's my maiden name. <laughs> uh, but this is the, we can just tolerate them and they keep sabotaging our lives. I'm telling you, these kind of things will steal opportunities you never knew were going to open to you. These kind of things will kill hope when you don't even, you're not even thinking about what's going on. It's just normal not to have hope because of what's always happened. Or they destroy relationships as long as we just tolerate them. So this, this is important to know and recognize. See, Cain had the, a problem like this, which Cain, everybody does. Let's start there. But Cain had a problem. He didn't know there was anything on his porch until God told him. And God said, Cain, sin is crouching at your door. Mm -hmm. Now break that down into all the concepts of what God was saying there. He's saying, Cain, the potential for you to continually fall short of who you were meant to be is right there on your front porch. The possibility and the likelihood of you missing the mark of what you were born to do is right there on your front porch, just like, is like a dog waiting to grab your heel. It's crouching at your door. So what he was telling Cain is you, there's, there's the possibility you'll live your life continually disappointed, that you're going to be a sense there a failure that's going to crouch on your porch and catch your feet. God told him this thing's going to dictate your life if you don't master it. And that's, he said it. If you don't master it, it will master you. He told Cain real plainly. And Cain didn't, and it did. It mm -hmm. mastered him. Mm -hmm. We don't know a whole lot about Cain. The Bible doesn't say a whole lot about him. But we do know from what we saw, just of what the story that we have in Genesis that we saw him operate in willfulness, offense, and anger. Now, he obviously had a problem with willfulness. And if you look up in the dictionary what that means, it means being obstinately bent on having your own way. Hmm. Now, don't raise your hand or point at anybody, <laughs> but does anybody come to mind? <laughs> obstinately bent on having your own way. This is the way I think it should be. This is the outcome I expect. And if it's not that, there's going to be trouble. That's willfulness. Cain brought a sacrifice, but he brought it his way. He didn't do it like God told him to. And then when it wasn't successful, what did he do? He got offended. And he got resentful. And he went into an angry sulk. You ever been around people who sulk? Uh, sometimes that's a norm. And I'll tell you this, if you got, if you got, you know, somebody who sulks on a regular basis, you stay away from them on a regular basis usually. Because it's not fun being in that atmosphere. And there's no making them happy. I mean, I, I see people dancing in place trying to make their dad happy or their cousin happy or their friend happy. And I want to say, give up, you know. <laughs> Those kind of people, when they walk in, you want to say, why don't you just go ahead, get in the mood, sit down and shut up, get it over with. Because it's a norm and you can expect it of them and it's very hard to deal with. But the thing we've got to realize is all the contradictions in our life, no matter how little or how big, they're going to have consequences in our future if we don't overcome them. And let's be clear about this. Let me just stop and say this. When I'm talking about contradictions this morning, I am not saying that if they're in your thoughts or your beliefs or your behavior, your personality, or even your track record, 
I'm, t I'm not saying that contradictions are an eternal judgment against you and they're going to take you to hell. No, that is not what we're talking about here. He, God didn't say to Cain, boy, you got a ticket to hell right there on your porch, right by your door, crouching down. That's not what God was saying. God was not cutting him off or writing him off. And we're not written off for having contradictions in our life. What he was telling Cain was a warning. If you don't master this, It'll master you. It will dictate your future. It will trip you up. It will get. It will, you'll live on a merry-go-round. The same thing keep happening until you overcome this contradiction. So what God was saying to Cain is, I'm, t I'm giving you a warning because I love you. I'm giving you a warning that says you, you need to come to repentance. Because the Bible, when the Bible talks about repentance... What the Bible means is, I need you to consider things differently and change your thinking. Hmm. That's what needs to happen. And without repentance, you never change your thinking. Right. Uh, it just you keep doing the same thing. You live on that merry-go-round. Hmm. And this means I need you to overcome these things by thinking different, Cain. That's what he was saying. Because I need you to overcome the damage it can cause. But you know, I wonder, I look back on it and wonder if Cain was insulted by God talking about repentance to him. Come to me, let's change your thinking. Because I know people, you can't mention the word repentance to them because they immediately feel condemned, which that there's no reason to feel condemned when you talk about repentance. I mean, they look at repentance like it's an indictment instead of an opportunity. Yeah. Repentance is the opportunity to change and make things change around you in your life. But some people think repentance is always going to be an indictment, and it's not. It's a chance to take a right turn. Mm -hmm. Repentance is a good, positive thing. Now, what I'm telling you right now, I didn't know this growing up. Mm -hmm. I grew up on the church bench, and I, as a young girl, I didn't understand this. I thought that repentance was an event where you go to the altar, you know, your heart is touched, you go to the altar, you confess your sin, and then you don't go, that when you get up from there, that means you don't go to hell and you have a ticket to heaven, a pass to heaven called salvation. That was about the theology I operated on as a young girl. So when I would read the scripture where Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, I thought he was telling me to go back to the altar and confess my sins again and get saved again, basically. I thought that's what that meant. And because when he, when I heard the preacher say, repent for the kingdom's at hand, what I heard was, girl, you better get your heart right with God because you could be at the pearly gates in the next minute. That's what I heard. I didn't understand beyond that. And it brought me to the conclusion that I was just born to get saved, to stay saved, and to go to heaven. And I have to tell you, in my early teens, the zeal for life with that philosophy began to wear off. I mean, that's living in a maintenance mode. That's not some great adventure and a lifetime to look forward to and a challenge. And I thought, Lord, this doesn't sound good to me. And when the older saints in our church, like on Wednesday night, they'd have a testimony service. And I can't tell you how many of them would stand up and cry and talk about uh, mansions and streets of gold and sitting by a river with a harp. And I'm sitting there. See why I thought I was a rebel? I thought, dear God. This sounds so boring. And I think, I can't live my whole life just trying to get to heaven, God. Something's, something's not right here. But I had no idea in my limited understanding of salvation that those beliefs I had actually contradicted God's character, contradicted his word, and it certainly contra contradicted his plans and destiny in my life. So thinking that my salvation was just a pass to heaven that doesn't cut it. So, because I had to protect my behavior daily so that I didn't mess up and lose my past. And so, my word, I lived in the tension of that. And it was like, no wonder I couldn't enjoy school or anything else. I was worried about, you know, I'm dangling over the edge of hell right here every day. It was a maintenance mentality. And that kind of thinking contradicts the awesomeness of salvation. And at nine years old, I didn't know salvation brought me into Jesus Christ as a joint heir with him. 
I didn't realize <clears throat> that salvation wasn't just a pass to heaven. Salvation was an entering into an unbreakable covenant with God the Father. And I didn't have to worry that I was constantly dangling over the edge of hell anymore once I began to see and hear this teaching. But hey, y'all, we're talking 20s and 30-year-olds before I get to the awareness of this. So eventually, I did come to repentance. And I even had to come to repentance about the word repentance. I had to come to a new understanding and think differently about it. I had to come to a new understanding about what salvation meant. And so I'd be aware that my salvation carries God's original intent. When that, you know, when that came alive in me and that the plans of God, the design of God was in this salvation he had given me, I had to see salvation so much bigger than I had seen it. It was the power of God given to me, the power of God in me, not only to save me from hell, but to save me from myself. <clears throat> the power of your salvation, grab that, because your salvation can save you from the generational patterns that were on your porch when you were born. It can save you from the things that have, have sabotaged and tripped up your, your ancestors. Your salvation has the power of God to overcome anything that contradicts his will, his purpose, and his intent for you. I mean, if we do what we were born to do, y'all, whatever that is, there's no one thing. If we are who we were born to be, that's how we glorify our Father. Mm -hmm. He says, here's my plan, and watch my son, watch my daughter. This is who I told them to be, this is who I've equipped them to be, empowered them to be, graced them to be, and that brings glory to our Father with our life. I don't care if, if he's talking about being the, the postmistress in a town of 200. If that's the will of God, you bring glory to God by being faithful to what you were born to do. And if we get a double-fisted grip on our salvation and the awesomeness of it and its power to save us from ourselves, anything in us that contradicts us, save us from the things that work against us, then salvation is the power of overcoming contradictions, okay? And salvation is being born again into the kingdom of powerful kingdom of God. And that's not just somewhere over the rainbow someday. Someday. The kingdom is not just a future thing. Because here's what the kingdom of God is. It is his rule, his government, his authority, his presence. That and when has that never been? Psalm 145 said the kingdom of God has e eternal. It's always been and it always will be. His government and power has always been there. It's not confined to a place that we go with God after death. That was a great revelation to know I didn't have to die to see the government of God. Do you understand that's why Jesus sometimes when he would heal people, he'd say the kingdom has come upon you. What he was saying was, that thing, that, that disease that's been governing the cells and the organs in your body, I am, I'm pulling a coup right here. We're going to throw that government off mm -hmm. and let the government of the kingdom of God come and bring healing because there is no disease in heaven. There is no sickness there. And that's why Jesus taught us to pray. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Your kingdom come. Your authority, your power manifest. And to, I mean, this was a whole new world for this little church girl. It was like, dear Lord, now this will put some spit in me, you know, to live and find God and get past and overcome anything in the way there. And But if we don't know about this presence and power that Jesus demonstrated, how likely uh, are we to do God's will on a daily basis? I feel sorry for people who don't understand that the power of your gift of salvation is the most awesome thing you can imagine. Don't limit it. And how do you speak a word of deliverance to a lady in the grocery store if you don't know the kingdom of God yes. is here and now and can make the difference mm -hmm. of what's ruling in your life? I mean, I was so grateful when I began to realize the Holy Spirit's the one who draws us to think differently. Mm -hmm. He draws us to repentance. Mm -hmm. And what does the word say? It's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. I mean, we preach it like it's condemnation and threat and fear of hell that draws men to God. Not really. You might, that might draw you to want to run to God, 
But a relationship with him needs to be based in truth, love, understanding of who he is, and understanding of who he, he is for you. Amen. And that kind of understanding makes the difference. So after I began to see these things, then when I would read the scripture, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that didn't mean I had to go get saved again to me. No, it wasn't about getting to the pearly gates any minute, being at hand. What it meant was, Kathy, everything I have is within reach. So if anything I have provided and told you that your salvation includes, whether it's healing or uh, changing circumstance, miracles, whatever, if you can't reach it and feel like it's beyond your reach, then go back up to the penthouse of your soul, the thinking, and see what needs to change. Because you need to think differently if I'm limited as God in any way. That contradicts the truth. So go back up to the penthouse and repent. Think differently. Find out. Because his word tells us, I won't withhold any good thing from you. And he won't delay things until eternity, y'all. We don't need healing in eternity. Yeah. We don't need deliverance in heaven. We need the power and the kingdom of God and the manifestation of all his provision in the earth. That's why Jesus said, pray, your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as in heaven. That means this piece of earth right here, Lord, we need a display of your provision and healing in this place. We need it today. So true... True uh, repentance is always going to be a plus, y'all. And we're learning to think like our Father and see things like He does. When God calls us into thinking differently, we come out with life. We come out empowered. We come out ready to see things change. So you don't, you know, this this is very. This comes very down to the nitty gritty, to like these children sitting here this morning. If you've been abused in your life. What the repentance will do, will it'll make you stop thinking you're worthless. Mm -hmm. the, what happened to you made you think you're worthless. Or you make you stop thinking you're stupid because somebody called you stupid. It will change the way you think. Mm -hmm. but, now tell me, do you see if, if somebody's convinced they're worthless or stupid, do you see how that's going to contradict their destiny? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. They'll never get to that success that God put in them. Mm -hmm. The Lord's had me praying that for the last two weeks. God, let the success you have put in us manifest. Yes. He already has a plan, and his, his plan for us is fulfillment. For him is success of something bigger than us. Amen. Hey, y'all, we're, we're a part of history. Amen. We're here to be writing history or to walk out history that he's already written. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people say, well, my name's in the Lamb book of Lamb's Book of Life. And they think it's a list. I don't think it's a list. I think it's a book of life. I think he has several paragraphs written about each one of us. And this is what will happen when they walk with me and overcome the contradictions that try to keep them from it. This is what I'm going to do through their lifetime while they're on the earth. That's a book of life. Mm -hmm. So repentance is what gives us that new thinking to go beyond where we've been. And uh, living like this is what brings glory to God. And you need to understand this. If you're sitting here this morning and breathing, then there's a God purpose still in you. Amen. There's a God purpose alive and ready to be fully walked out in you. And here's the thing. <laughs> he doesn't change his mind, y'all. This is why I said don't take condemnation when you have to change your mind. Because that is not, he's not saying you're cut off. He doesn't change his mind about you. He doesn't change his mind about his good plans for you. So you know what he does? He's faithful to intersect your life with his good plans every opportunity he has. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you right now that's usually going to involve changing your thinking about something and getting you to a different answer so you're willing. I mean, you may live in the county you live in just so God has a legal access because he does things by the principles he set up in the beginning, and he gave us dominion in the earth. He may have you living in the county you live in so that he has legal access to change the corruption of that, that that's in that county government. That may be a purpose going on with your life that you're not even aware of. 
And perhaps you're raising a child or a grandchild that's going to be revolutionize the tech world and the media world 20 years from now. You can't see that from where you're sitting today. But the purpose of God has that kind of far reach. And you do your part and steward what he gives you today. He's the Lord of the harvest. And he's the Lord who brings it to pass. You may live on a street positioned there very specifically by God to be an intercessor protector for three children that live there or three young people who live there. Because what they've got ahead of them is the mayor, the sheriff, and the high school principal. But the enemy's trying to take them out, and they've got nobody else to pray for them but you. That may be part of your geography. I'm telling you, God is in these kind of intricate details. So that's why we can't just tolerate something that contradicts and trips us up and undermines us and tries to take us out because we've got something to do. You may be God's medicine that makes people laugh. I mean, we've got some cousins. We laugh before they open their mouth. When they walk in, we start laughing. They are just always funny. Uh, you may be an encourager that dare, you can help people dare to hope again. You may not think these things are awesome, but you don't know the big picture. You just steward the part you have, and this is who you are. This is what you do. Many times we're not aware that God is doing stuff in our lives, but it's happening. And you know why I can say that so with such confidence? Because he's faithful to his plans. He's faithful to you. He's faithful to Amen. his intent. He's faithful to get you and urge you toward his outcome continually. He is faithful. So he's going to help you. Anytime it's a contradiction in your attitude or your conclusion, your feelings, your beliefs, if they contradict his design and hear this, he intends that you outlive every contradiction. Yes. Amen. To your purpose and fulfillment, he intends that you outlive it. You're thinking, God, you could look at me. I couldn't have more than 30 days left. And he said, he's saying, don't tell me you're going to live till I get you to where you were born to go. That's, his, that's how he looks at it. That's the kind of heart we need. If there's a contradiction between here and there, we, I'll overcome it by your grace. Amen. If it's in your health, okay, I'm always telling my body, body, you straighten up. You don't work against me. You work with me. We're going to carry out the work and the plan of God for my life. No matter what it is, I need you to straighten up and work with me. I talk to my body like that. And most of the time, it snaps too. <laughs> Sometimes it takes two or three days of talking. But if it's for health or if it's finances or if it's circumstances or if it's your belief system or your feelings, if they're contradicting God's plan and design, he intends you to overcome that. Even if your track record till this point in your life has just been a downward spiral most of your life, I'm telling you today, don't compare your future with the past. Yes. Don't compare your future with what <coughs> usually happens. They call that, what is it, Murphy's Law. This always happens. Uh-uh. Don't compare your future with that. Trust God for the empowerment to overcome what is contradicting. Because we can't believe in Murphy's Law more than we believe in the Almighty mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. We can't believe in our own weaknesses more than we believe in His strength. That's true. That, we, we can't live in that kind of contradiction. Mm -hmm. And if those things are in the back of your mind somewhere, come to an awareness of it. Catch it. Then shoot it. You know, don't just let your mind think that way because that is contrary. That's a contradiction to the will of God. And let me just tell you this with all accuracy. Keep your gun handy because there is no, there is no being so perfect. I, mean, I kid you not, it's by my front door now, and I take it out when I go out to exercise. We're not playing with snakes. Hmm. But there is there's no being so perfect that nothing will ever crawl back up on your porch. There's no such thing as that. So don't get that in your head. There will always be stuff to creep up, to trip up. That's life. But you don't stop there and say, oh, that's life. That's life. But things like, think, and I'm talking about things crawling up in your, into your, the front porch of your soul, like hurt feelings or <coughs> despair, disappointment, discouragement, unforgiveness, misunderstanding. Those are terrible contradictions to your day and to your mission. 
But if they keep showing up after you've already dealt with them, and you're saying, well, how many times do I have to overcome the same stuff, self-doubt, insecurity, and fear? You know what the answer is? As many times as that crawls on your porch, you have to overcome it. You can get more bullets, overcome it. You don't run out. Reload, go back out there and shoot. But you don't give up and just stay sabotaged. You don't give up and let these things just live in your soul like they're truth because they're not. So two things to take home with us today. One is always remember that repentance is the best tool in your toolbox. Use it every time you need it. God, what you're saying is I'm open to Lord. You show me how to think different and I'm on my way there because I want to walk in abundant life whenever, however. And number two, contradictions and patterns that you need to face don't measure your future by what they've been in your past experience don't believe predictions and statistics and what happened to everybody else more than you believe God's plans for you that's a contradiction to believe that overcome it you think about Lazarus and his sisters you know what the statistics said back then if you die, get buried in a tomb, you stay dead. Yeah. <laughs> that was the statistics. Uh -huh. But God had other plans for that family. And so the contradiction was overcome, and he came up out of that tomb. Now, that's what I mean by you. God wants you to outlive contradictions. God's plans were more powerful than what was normal in that day. God's plans are more powerful than what's normal today. He is our God, and we need to overcome anything that dares to doubt or contradict who he is. I mean, that was God's intent, resurrecting out of the grave, y'all. And it, it overcame contradiction for sure. Everybody in the community and the region knew contradiction had to bow when God shows up. That's the way we need to live. That's our, our belief system. God is bigger than contradiction. Yes. He faithfully guards his original intent that he put in you, that he decided over you, and that he has been guarding all your life till now. And there's no contradiction bigger than your God. None. I don't care what your condition, it's not bigger than your God. If you got pain or dysfunction, or you got a, da a damaged self-image, or hopelessness or fear, it's contradicting who you're born to be. Lift your head today and realize He's ready to supernaturally enable you, which is called the grace of God, to come out of contradiction. His grace will empower you to do that. And you're the overcomer, and you take ground every time you overcome these things. I didn't come here without contradictions in my own life. I'm not talking about I am the princess of no contradictions. No. All I'm telling you is I got a gun and you can have one too. That's all I'm telling you. I, there's contradictions right on my porch, y'all. There's the things going on that cause delay, cause detours, cause distractions to keep me from fulfillment and promise. So I came today to take hope with you. And I pray you take hope. Let God lift our head. And this is the scripture that uh, I want to read closing here. Isaiah 50 verse 7 says, the Lord God will help me, therefore I shall not be confounded. And that word confounded means I'm not going to stay hurt. I'm not going to stay wounded. I'm not going to stay reproached. I'm not going to stay, stay taunted or ashamed or confused. I'm not going to stay in contradiction because the Lord said he would help me. He's my help. I'm not going to live a life being sabotaged by every opposition that rises in my face. I'm going to set my face like flint, the scripture says, because I know God will never let me down. Amen. 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 And if you would say to the Lord, no matter what the contradiction, I'm going to set my face like flint, Lord, Amen. and I'm going to see the salvation of the Lord. Because when you say, I'm going to see the salvation of the Lord, you're saying, I'm going to see the deliverance of God. I'm going to see the victory of God. I'm going to see the prosperity of God. I'm going to see the health of God, the wholeness of God, and the help of God. Salvation means all those things right there in that verse. That's literally what it means. So if you want 
to set your face like flint today? I do. I was looking forward to coming this morning for this. If you want to set your face like flint because you know God's going to help you overcome, stand with me. We'll just close with a, an agreement. Lord, we agree in prayer concerning these things yes, that you plan for yes, us, amen. that you have well ample supply of grace yes. to get us there to overcome anything that dares contradict the abundant life yes. that you made available. Lord, we love you too much to live our whole life, yes. not even reaching for and expecting mm -hmm. to walk in abundant life, yes. to walk with advantages without limitation. Yes. You are our God. Let our lives display your glory. Yes, Let people see when they look what God does in their life. Look mm -hmm. how far they reach beyond the things that oppose us, the things that contradict mm -hmm. average and typical people, but they're reaching beyond because you're their God. Yes, Be glorified yes. through us. Be glorified in us. And Lord, I thank you. Call us to repentance. Call us to thinking different. Call us where our thoughts are coming to the wrong conclusions. Show us, Lord, how to kill the snake. Show us, Lord, how to step on that contradiction and get beyond it for glory's sake, for a legacy. Lord, these things, we don't want them left. We don't want contradictions left to become our legacy to anybody that our life affects. In our reach, Lord, be glorified. Let us see your victory, your salvation, and we say yes and set our hearts and our face like flint to do so. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen.